to that house. If anything, you're going to have to get rid of it. I already talked about this meter. Mold guidance. That's the website you go to for mold guidance, the one in blue. All this information is free. Basically says protect the mitigator, protect the occupant, figure out why you had a moisture problem. We already talked about radon. Radon simple. <laughs> Suck it out from under your house and put it outside. Dilution will never take care of radon unless you want to spend an awful lot of money on pumping air through your house. Um, there's a protocol proposed for weatherization crews that basically says test it before you fix it. If it's high, fix it while you're fixing it or don't fix it. If you test it before and it's okay and you test it after and it's high, someone probably ought to fix the radon. And then the question is, who's going to pay? The weatherization crew or someone else? I'm not going to go into any of those details. There's a lot of discussion about can I keep radon low by air sealing the sumps, installing drains that don't directly go to the earth and sealing and caulking. That's all controversial at the moment. There's no test data that says if I do anything other than suck it under the slab, will it keep radon out? There's, there's a proposal to get the folks in Maine to actually do some testing this winter. And the weatherization crews will, at, on high rate on homes, they'll put in the suction, they'll pay for that, and then they'll cap it off and see what the number is without it running versus with it running after they've done air sealing and caulking, et cetera. Stay tuned. Lead, pretty simple, follow state guidance. State of New Hampshire, I assume, has lead guidance. You don't know. The, fed, the feds enacted lead guidance in April. I think it's been delayed for a couple of months. But Hebra, Hebra Home Builders Association of New Hampshire, is running lead workshop training at the moment. You might want to think about running it here to meet OSHA guidelines. In Maine, you get guidance. I assume there's a website for New Hampshire on lead. Lead's pretty straightforward. <laughs> if, the, if the paint's fallen off and it's old, it's probably full of lead. If the outside paint is old and fallen off, it's probably full of lead. If you're doing work outside the house, don't go tracking it all inside the house is the guidance. If it's pre-1940, it likely has lead. And there's all the guidance, the federal guidance and state guidance is pretty simple. Don't spread lead, lead, dust, lead dust around the house. Figure out how to not sand it, not disturb it, pick it up with a HEPA vacuum. And don't spread lead dust outside into the house is the guidance. Asbestos. <laughs> All kinds of laws governing asbestos. The bottom line is don't disturb it unless you know what the heck you're doing. Asbestos could be in almost always in steam pipe wraps. It could be in tile if it's a nine by nine tile and it might be in siding, the old cement asbestos siding. Most contractors will not drill a hole in asbestos cement siding because they don't want to get yelled at. They'll figure out how to attach it to the trim as opposed to the siding. Certainly you wouldn't take a four inch hole saw and go through asbestos siding without getting a whopping dose of asbestos in your lungs. Pests, pretty straightforward. Um, don't make it worse. Patch holes with appropriate materials, which is steel wool. This is steel wool stuffed in here. Someone had patched pests. This is that copper. This is Copper wool bought from mypestcontrol.com. It comes on a roll and you cut it off and stick it in your mouse hole and then stick your squirt foam in so the critters won't. I can attest that <laughs> flying squirrels will eat through six inches of squirt foam overnight. And then if you trap them and kill them, they eat each other. I mean, they're the worst critters I've ever tried to deal with are flying squirrels. You guys ever dealt with flying squirrels? Yeah. Unbelievable. I had a colony of them living in one of my sheds. I learned very painfully that this is bad stuff. <laughs> yeah, I trapped them in rat traps. You'd come back a week later, and whatever you caught in the trap is gone because they'd eat it. <laughs> yeah. Pretty, 
pretty crazy stuff. And then I did the squirt foam thing, and there's a hole in the squirt foam. That's six inches deep, three inches wide. They went through it overnight. Worse than rats. That's the kind of stuff he'd use for dealing with critters. That roach powder is, is um, boric acid, borax. Um, pretty innocuous stuff for people, but critters don't like it. And you gotta figure out how to keep the bats and raccoons out. That's how you keep the mice out of vents is with hardware cloth. Those are the materials you'd use. ETS. The current guy, what I've, most weatherization crews now tell homeowners that smoke, we've made your house tighter. It may make the smoking levels in your house worse. Worse, worse you might want to consider abandoning your smoking habit and then walk away, which is at least factual information. Garage pollutants, again, air seal between the garage. New construction, it's easy to do. A renovation, it's much greater, tougher work. Ozone, don't breathe it. Home safety, we already talked about. Worker safety, we already discussed briefly. If you want to know where to find all this stuff, there's the websites. If you want to get involved at the federal level, there's the websites. Um, you always got to control heat, air, and moisture in houses. The vice president is even involved in all this stuff, which is fascinating. The White House is, wants healthy housing. Um, if you want to know what the federal stuff is going on, that's the person to deal with it. Let's do the case study. So this is a case study courtesy of Terry Brennan. How many of you saw, were in the class last year where Terry came in? Yeah. I think I was. He's a guy from New York? Yeah. yeah. So is my battery di dying? Uh, I, good old batteries. Don't you love them? Uh, no, there it is. 24%. Now that's dew point. You measured what? 38%? Yeah. These are now reading different. This one's 24, this is 30. So who knows? Bottom line is it's not wet. It's not wet. Um, most people consider 20 to 30 dry. Real dry is five. At five, I can't wear contacts, and neither can anyone else. And at 30, most people in January would really be happy to have their house at 30% RH. If you run your house much higher than 30% RH in January, what do you risk doing? And the answer is destroying it. Because if you got dew point under the windows and water dripping down and dew point in the attics, you risk rotting your house out. So most people can't run houses at much more than 30% RH in the wintertime. 40 if you're lucky. 50 pretty much in this climate means your house is rotting away in the wintertime. So this is a case study. This is your standard, what, 1938 vintage New England house. Um, the before conditions are three inches of vermiculite was in the attic. And in the top floor walls, there was nothing in the first floor walls. The stone basement is uninsulated. When they did a blower door test, it was 3,600 CFM at 50 pascals. The atmospherically vented 20-year-old plus boiler was replaced. The vinyl windows had already been replaced. The unheated addition is on the back side of this building is on a crawl space. So on the back side of this building is a build out with two stories and storage in there, and it's over a dirt floor crawl space attached to the back of the house. This is what the paint on the upper story, so that thing that, this, this is the unheated, essentially double porch on the back side of the house. So where the unheated portion is attached to the top of the, this is attic up in here. Certainly it looks like there's some kind of moisture wicking going on where the clapboards end against the roof. This is a side view of the house. This is what the basement looks like. Dry or wet? 
Anybody? Wet. Wet. Yeah, I mean, don't any of you have been around one of these? Wet. You know, you. So that's a wet basement, but they air seal the building anyways. That's the tra trap door in the crawl space on the unheated addition in the back. You can see the treasures. That's looking sideways in the crawl space once you get down in the trap door. So you stick your head down, hold the camera down and take a picture. That's what you get in the crawl space, exposed dirt. There are functional bathroom exhaust fans and they work quiet enough to leave running. That's the lead paint that's peeling beside the vinyl windows. That's the attic after they fixed it and this is the exhaust fan from the bathroom going up. And what's underneath that blown in cellulose is two inches of spray foam. So they put down two inches of spray foam to air seal the attic because it was lath and plaster, and then put uh, two feet of cellulose over it. That's the stairs that go to the attic. You may notice, so it looks like they blew cellulose on each stair cavity. You may notice there's little specks of what looks like this stuff. Can you see them sort of laying on the steps? And you go to the top step and there's, that's what the top step looks like. What do you think is going on? Something's eating it. Yeah, there's mice trying to get from the attic down into the house. So clearly there's a mouse problem in the house. Um, mouse in the house. Um, I set my eight traps in the attic last week because I was lying in bed and heard it's like, oh shit, I haven't set the traps this year. And, opened the trap door and got the ladder and the peanut butter and went upstairs and cleaned out all the traps on the gang planks and reset them all and I'm sure they'll be full again but if you can take an old house and keep mice out of it you're doing better than I. That's the basement. So above your head they put on an inch of squirt foam. So they've air sealed the basement floor, they've air sealed the attic floor they're blowing all the walls full of cellulose. They're drastically going to reduce the heating bill in this house. Absolutely no question that this will drastically reduce the heating bill. That's the new sealed combustion gas fired boiler. The chimney's gone. That's water dripping off the plywood in the basement. So that's inside the basement where a piece of plywood was replaced that went to the crawl space. You can see they've run a pipe out there, but there's water dripping off the cold piece of plywood. So the plywood's obviously cold enough that dew point is occurring on the plywood. That's the upper level of that unheated addition on the back. That's the ceiling of the back unheated addition. This is all over a dirt floor crawl space. So the ceiling is covered with mold in the back addition. That's the inside of that back addition crawl space. The lead paint in the ceiling is all bubbling and falling off. You can see the holes from where they insulated the attached wall. So clearly it looks like there's lots of moisture accumulating in the unattached addition on the back side of the house. It's reported the paint wasn't doing this prior to making the house energy efficient. So the energy that was coming out of that wall, keeping that space warmer, is now gone so that now the moisture is hitting dew point on the ceiling. That's the inside of the home. If you look carefully at the furniture, it looks a little bit funny if you look at the right angle with light shining from a flashlight across the finishes, there's mold growing over all the furniture in the house. Throughout the whole house, the relative humidity level is over 60%. So that's what the vinyl windows look like. This is during winter. The cabinet door is no longer closed, so they've swelled. 
and the addition on back that's uninsulated, the glass on the inside is covered with moisture. So what problem exists is the question. Ventilation. Not enough ventilation? Could be. Anyone else? Possibly not um, getting at the source of the water initially. They left. Well, do you think the basement's a real strong moisture source? Yeah. Do you think the crawl space is a real strong moisture source? So they left very strong moisture sources and air sealed the house. So your idea is actually an interesting one. You could say, at the moment, this is a winter moisture problem. I know if I bring cold air into a home in the wintertime, what do I do? I dry out the house. Because cold outside air can't hold moisture. When I bring 20 degree air into a house and warm it up to 70 degrees, it dries the house out. So I could add a fan back in to the basement and actually push air into the basement to dry it out. Now I risk freezing up pipes and I risk making the basement cold, but they've already isolated the basement from the living space. What you'd actually prefer to have do, do here, if you had the money to do it, what would you do? You'd not put that foam above your head in the basement. You'd make sure there's reasonable drainage around the building, and you'd put squirt foam all around the basement walls to stop the moisture source. And you may have to do something to the basement floor. That's the right way. Now I've got a usable, dry and warm basement the preferred way of building houses in all cases is make the basement or crawl space dry and warm. A dry and warm crawl space or basement will never become a mold factory where you get your breathing air from it. That's the new guidance for buildings. Make the crawl space or basement like it's a living space from an insulation and air quality perspective. Um, one option that's been proposed is put an air-to-air -air heat exchanger in the basement and see if it dries it out enough without an energy penalty that the moisture problem goes away. I actually don't know what's been done. We should talk to Terry. You can ask Terry what's been done to his New York house. Oh, this is house? It's not his house. It's a client he went to, took all the pictures. So certainly weatherization crew doing what they're trained to do and doing it right ended up with a hell of a problem. Um, and that's the current concern right now from EPA and DOE. We've got some great weatherization crews who have really good training on how to save energy. We need to provide additional training on how to do it without screwing up the air quality. I gotta be someplace later, guys, so I'm happy to stick around another five minutes, but uh, you got any questions on, I mean, I digress for Wes's question on insulation. You got any other questions? I have one. You plan on going into the indoor air quality as a career field. What are the steps that you should take to get there? <laughs> what a wonderful question. The last guy I hired, right now I'm worried about keeping people employed in this economy, but the last guy I hired is a mechanical engineer who didn't have a job, who came to my house construction workshops and asked a zillion questions. I said, you're asking great questions. Why? He said, because I'm interested in this. I said, come talk to me Monday morning. So, I, I mean, if, if you have any kind of reasonable passion for, for health and safety and construction, that, to me that's the most important ingredient. Don't come knocking on my door if you don't have that passion, because I'm not gonna hire you. That, that said, right now the issue in this economy is who's hiring anybody? You know, my daughter has a, a surgical tech to, certificate and can't get a job in an operating room for the first time in the history of surgical tech graduates because no hospitals are hiring anyone at the moment. 
So for me, any training, I always choose to hire engineers and train them to understand air quality because in big buildings, you have to be able to understand HVAC system. Um, in residential stuff, anyone who's a good weatherization guy can learn to understand air quality. But you certainly have to have some kind of working knowledge of buildings and construction and how air moves. You know? um, if, if, you know, BPI training would be wonderful training for anyone that's interested in this as a field. Um, what you really need to do is figure out how to get your foot in the door because there is no one place to get trained to, to do this stuff. I have one certified industrial hygienist on staff. A certified industrial hygienist knows nothing about indoor air quality unless they've retrained to learn it. And if that helps you or not. It's part of the reason, you know, when I first started doing this, the major work we did was indoor air quality. It's not our major work right now. Our major work right now is moisture and indoor air quality. Moisture problems in buildings aren't going to go away. So certainly, um, if, if you can get hired or you can afford it, the, the best training you can get in building science in New England is Joe Steebrook's course. His Building Science Corp runs workshops nationally. They have to be in Massachusetts. And they run a, a workshop in August and a workshop in December. But it's 700 bucks for the workshop. But you will not find better moisture training than you'll get at Joe's workshops. And if you want a taste of Joe's stuff, he usually presents at the Nessie conference in March. Um, so you can get a, you know, you can get a taste of what he does there. Also, Building Science Corp has a big website, right? If you, you could spend. You could run a training, you could run a semester training course from Joe's website. Might be something you want to think about. There's, there's more material. Joe basically got DOE to pay him to do stuff, and it's all posted on the website. So if you wanted one website to learn about moisture and building science, building science corp, building science .com, is it a building science corp? Google building science corp, and you'll hit all the hits on his website. There's everything on that website from how to deal with old rubble foundations and foam them like this to uh, the most technical information you'd ever want to find on, on air barriers and vapor barriers. And, um, you know, a lot of this business right now is a niche market. I got three guys I just paid to have trained to be Air Barrier Association of America auditors. Because all new buildings right now in certain states have to have an air barrier installed on the exterior. And the ABAA actually has auditors that go out and look at jobs under construction to see if the contractor is doing it right as an independent audit for the owner. So there's pretty amazing stuff happening. And I hope last night doesn't change much of that. Well, I mean, if you listen to them, the Republicans are going to we're going to have lots of jobs because they're going to do a better job at it than the Democrats. So your daughter should be fine. You all should be getting jobs, no sweat. Right? <laughs> I mean, listen, sorry. It's not easy stuff. Yeah. No, I know. Uh, I mean, the great news, I have mixed feeling about over-regulation. But the great news is I know a quarter of my friends right now that have work because of federal money that would be out of jobs without the federal money. And a lot of them are in this field. Yeah, I mean, the era of money that's gone to school has kept a lot of people working in New Hampshire in the past two years. Sure. Thank you so much. Thank you. Well, one of you guys uh, be willing, he's got a bunch of stuff. Give him a hand out I, for the car. I actually think I can move it all. Okay. Thank you so much. Yeah. I'll call me or whatever. That was your turn. That's probably why I didn't make it.
it's a I wish you'd say something to your own. Why? Went by your original friends. I didn't realize I needed to check it out. If you can, Grace. I will see what you can do. There's definitely one that I think for um, building a class. Huh? Yeah. I used to work this week. One way or another, we're working this way. Okay. Thanks again. We really appreciate it. And that's the catalogs, uh, you know, Minecraft. Do you need help? No. Thank you. You're going to take tomorrow's uh, one o'clock class.